The most important covalent molecule on planet Earth is obviously water, or H2O. You can see in the diagram how hydrogen is sharing electrons with oxygen to form a molecule of water. Water is also polar, which means it has a slight static charge. This polarity lends water many of its incredible properties. Oxygen is colored red. Red just means that it's slightly negative. And the reason why it's more negative is because oxygen is more electronegative. It wants the electrons a little bit more than the hydrogens do. So there's this unequal sharing of electrons. Meanwhile, the hydrogens are colored blue because they're slightly positive. And when you have two different regions on this molecule, one side is positive, the other side is negative, we say that it's polar. It's kind of like North Pole and South Pole, or North and South on a magnet. It's just two different contrasting areas on the same molecule. And because they have this sort of effect, it gives water many of its special properties, all because of polarity. Water can form a special type of bond known as hydrogen bonds. They're illustrated in the pictures above me, and they're represented with the dotted lines. You could see how an oxygen on one water molecule is attracted to hydrogen of a different water molecule. It's this slight attraction, or this hydrogen bonding, that gives water its special abilities and properties. Because of hydrogen bonding, water has many special properties. The first one is a really high boiling point. So compared to other molecules that are around the same size and mass, Water has an extremely high boiling point. It's a liquid at room temperature, and it doesn't boil until 100 degrees Celsius. If you compare that with something like CO2 or carbon dioxide, the air that you're exhaling right now, carbon dioxide is a gas at room temperature because it's boiled off already, has a really low boiling point compared to water. Water also has a high specific heat. The specific heat is the energy required to change the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. It takes a lot of energy to change the temperature of water. I coated my hand with water, so the water absorbs the heat from the flames, keeping me safe. The balloon pops instantly because there's no water inside to absorb the heat. The water balloon is absorbing all the heat, so it takes quite some time before the balloon pops. This illustrates the fact that water has a high specific heat. It takes a lot of energy, it absorbs a lot of heat before its temperature starts to change. Now that you understand how water has a lot of special properties because of its polarity, the other thing I want to point out is symmetry and asymmetry also determine whether or not a molecule is nonpolar or polar. So on the left you have hydrogen, which is perfectly symmetrical, which makes it nonpolar. So there's this equal sharing of electrons, and because it has symmetry and it's nonpolar, typically this means it will be a gas at room temperature. So hydrogen is a gas at room temperature. CO2, carbon dioxide, what you're exhaling right now, is also a symmetrical, nonpolar molecule. And guess what? You're breathing out a gas at room temperature. On the other hand, you have water, which is asymmetrical. So there's this unequal sharing of electrons. You can see there's a color difference. There's a blue and a red region, which makes it polar. And because it's polar, it will make water a liquid at room temperature, which it is. So I have hydrogen, nitrogen, and CO2, which are all examples of molecules that are symmetrical and they're linear. And when these two combinations occur, you have a nonpolar molecule. So it's obvious how hydrogen and nitrogen are nonpolar. You can see how they're perfectly symmetrical and the electrons are being shared evenly. But for something like CO2, it might be a little misleading for students because they do see the different colors. They see like how carbon is less electronegative than the two oxygens that are on the ends. But actually, because there is the symmetry, the oxygens cancel each other out. Okay, so they're pulling equally. So it makes CO2 or carbon dioxide a nonpolar molecule. And at room temperature, CO2 is a gas, which is typical of things that are nonpolar. So in this example, I have HF, hydrogen fluoride, and HCN, which is hydrogen cyanide. And these are just two examples of things that are asymmetrical and linear, which makes them polar. So this one's obviously clear because you could see a contrast in the two electrostatic regions. There is one end that is blue and the other end, which is red. Here are two examples that are symmetrical and trigonal planar which means it will be nonpolar. So I've got boron trihydride and boron trifluoride. So because the atoms 
on the peripheries are all the same. Okay, so in the top example, you have boron trihydride. Those are three hydrogens. So the dipoles just cancel out. So it leaves you with a nonpolar molecule. And the same thing occurs in the looping image below. You have boron trifluoride. So you have three fluorines, which are all canceling each other out, right? So even though, even though those are polar covalent bonds, overall, the whole entire molecule has symmetry. And because it's symmetrical, that means it's going to be nonpolar overall. Here's a rare example of something that is asymmetrical, but trigonal planar, which means it will be polar overall. So this is CH2O, that's the formula for formaldehyde. And just like how we covered in Vesper, this thing is a 3-0. It's got three bonded atoms, no lone pairs around the center, which is carbon. So as a result of this, you have this unequal sharing, which results in polarity for this molecule. So the oxygen is the most electronegative thing here. And it's just overpowering carbon and both of the hydrogens. So that region will be negative, which is why it's red. And then right below, you have your blue region, which is electropositive. So because you have these two contrasting regions, this means this molecule overall, even though it's trigonal planar, it's asymmetrical and polar. These two molecules are symmetrical tetrahedral, which means it will be nonpolar. So you can see how carbon tetrahydride at the top there and carbon tetrafluoride, even though those are covalent polar bonds between the C and the F or the C and the H, because you have symmetry on all four ends, meaning those are all just four of the same atoms, you end up with a molecule that is nonpolar overall because it's symmetrical. Here are some examples of molecules that are asymmetrical and tetrahedral. So it might be difficult to remember, but if you are asymmetrical, that means you're polar. So we could see here in these three looping images how even though they're tetrahedral, they're all tetrahedral, Look at how there's contrasting colors, right? There's a red and a blue region because there's always like one or two atoms that are bonded to the center that makes it asymmetrical. So it kind of ruins the symmetry, okay? Because if you were to be a symmetrical tetrahedral molecule, whatever is bonded around the center should all be the same. But in these examples here, and let's just look at the top example, it's a CH3F right, for fluoromethane. And then you can look at this molecule in the center. Look at how it's CHCl3. So there's three chlorines and one hydrogen. So there's, there's this asymmetry, okay? It's not perfectly even. And because all these atoms have different electronegativities, it's gonna result in a molecule that is polar because there's this unequal sharing of electrons. Two shapes are always polar, so bent, like water, water is polar, and trigonal pyramid is also polar. So NH3 is an example, NH3 is ammonia, it's like Windex basically, so these molecules are always polar, and guess what they are at room temperature? They are typically liquid, so water is a liquid at room temperature because it is polar. If you're polar, you're sticky, you tend to attract the same molecules to each other, so they tend to cling on to each other a little bit better. They can hydrogen bond in some cases, and that's what explains um, water's high boiling point, and that is it can hydrogen bond simply because it's polar. It's got like these like electrostatic charges that allow them to stick and cling to each other. So the biggest takeaway is this. If you are symmetrical, that means you are nonpolar, and typically you're a gas at room temperature. So for example, CO2 or carbon dioxide fits this criterion. On the other hand, if you are asymmetrical, that means you're polar and most likely a liquid at room temperature. So water fits this criteria. So it is polar, it is asymmetrical, and because of this, it's able to form hydrogen bonds. And through hydrogen bonding, it has a lot of special abilities or properties. So one of them is a high specific heat, which means it takes forever for water to change its temperature, even when you heat it up. It's got these extra hydrogen bonds. And because of that, it also has a very high boiling point because first the heat has to sever those hydrogen bonds so that the water molecules begin to drift apart. And when they drift apart, they become gas or steam. But 
At room temperature, water is a liquid because, again, they can cling together and they're sticky. All because of hydrogen bonding and all because of polarity. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time on Wind Chemistry.